Welcome to the Modern Mythos Podcast, the show dedicated to the Call of Cthulhu role-playing game. I'm John Hook. And I'm Seth Gorkowski, and together we'll discuss writing, game mastering, player tips, and how you can apply them to your games of investigative horror. In this episode, we've got a couple of things we want to cover. One is uh, we want to each cover a Call of Cthulhu module and uh, kind of tell you how we would change it, not really change it, but how we would run it and any changes uh, if we feel that need to be made. Uh, but how would we run these uh, scenarios at our tables? And I just realized from our previous episode that we haven't played the code yet. So <laughs> I think that's going to be okay. It's not going to spoil anything. John, John. I know. I know. You promised to you're run just, me through it. You're just going to have to live with it, I think. But I just love this one so much, I, and, and I know it so well. I really wanted to talk about it. Uh, and that is the, the code. It is a scenario available in the current Mansions of Madness Volume 1 Behind Closed Doors, available from Chaosium. And this scenario is written by Chris Lackey. The setup is all the player characters. They don't necessarily have to know each other, but it certainly helps if they do know each other. But what they do or who they do know is the protagonist of the adventure and have been invited to his home, which they have not been to. So uh, while they're friends, they're, they're not so close that they've like been to his home. And the way it, uh, the scenario does not actually explain why, you know, oh, you're such close friends, but you've never been to his house. What they do talk about is that this close friend of yours, he has been away for many years, for like five years. So he's just been a correspondence friend uh, for the last five years. But even then, I was thinking to myself, well, prior to him stepping away from a teaching position, because this guy is a uh, is a physics professor. Prior to him stepping away from his teaching position, which is where all the player characters are supposed to have known him in his early portion of his life, why wouldn't they have, you know, back then had an opportunity to go to this house? Because the house needs to be a, an unknown factor for the characters. They can't have a pre-understanding of it. And so I write it off or have modified the scenario to say that this was an ancestral home for the uh, protagonist. I, if I remember right, I think his name is uh, Kenneth Connors. And uh, because this is an ancestral home, he's only inherited the home within the last five years. And so because of that, the, the close personal friends who are the uh, investigators, that's why they haven't uh, been to this house before because for the last five years, Kenneth has been doing private work. And so he's been sequestered in a way and just kind of communicating sporadically with his friends via letters. So he now has something that he wants to show to his friends. And so telegrams have gone out inviting them to come to a big party, a big, like a release party. It's not a gender reveal party. It's a scientific uh, discovery party. So the players come to this party. And so again, Seth, I do apologize. I do want to, I really want to tell this out for the, for the keepers who are, who may consider uh, running this. Spoilers come ahead. I'll, I'll, I'll just try to forget before you run me through it. You just have right. to change it a little. Right. I can, I can totally change it up. One of the player characters will receive an additional communique that the other player characters don't receive. This is kind of an interesting twist and setup in the game is uh, you as the game master, as the keeper, pick one player to have extra info. And that person receives a, a handwritten letter from Kenneth and it has a code, thus the name of the scenario. It has this uh, alphanumeric code and in the letter 
Kenneth is giving a warning about not to trust a person and keep this code secret, protect it at all costs. But he doesn't really explain why. He just kind of, it's kind of a rushed note. Everyone meets at this house and Kenneth is not around. So this doesn't really, you know, uh, spoil too much because this is, this is scripted where Kenneth is missing. And so now you have this large three-story mansion. In addition to the player characters, there are four other NPCs or five, five other NPCs at the house, four other guests who've been invited to this party and one manservant, you know, a butler and your host, your host is missing. And so now it becomes a, where is he? Is your host injured? Is he, did he fall down or something? So, uh, so now it becomes, Hey, we gotta, we gotta find our host. He, he's clearly, since he's not here at the party, He's got to be somewhere here in the house or on the grounds of the estate uh, of which there is uh, a wood line nearby. There's like a, like a little fire pit area where, you know, you could toast marshmallows and there's also a barn, kind of a dilapidated barn nearby as well. So you have all these places, you know, you could be searching a little bit into the nearby woods. You could search the grounds, the barn and three, full stories plus an attic space in this very large mansion. And it's cool because it's set up really kind of a sandbox. There's no, uh, you don't have to go to the kitchen first before you go to the dining room or, you know, the library, you know, it's a big expanded clue board, right? You can go anywhere and look anywhere. And so there are, a few clues that are anchored in a few spots, but you can easily move those around as needed. And there are a few events that the keeper can trigger at any time. So if you can get certain characters, maybe isolate them, run a certain event, right? And, and have them uh, have an encounter, or maybe you have a group in this other room, have an encounter there. The really cool thing uh, about this scenario also is that if you are a fan of Pulp Cthulhu, uh, the code will easily translate into Pulp Cthulhu uh, because of the whole aspect of weird science. As I said a moment ago, one of the player characters has some extra information. He's got he's got a, a an alphanumeric code. Well, that code is for a, a time suit. So if you can find the, the key device, which is a, you know, a, a punch key, you know, a keyboard kind of thing, if you can find the key and bring that element, that, that module and reattach it to the suit, you can key in that code that Kenneth sent you and possibly use the time suit. It's a really fun module. It can go in a lot of different ways. The one drawback that I have is that there is no map for the barn. So it would have been really nice if they could have uh, provided a map for that. And the one major handout in this scenario is like seven pages long. It is a huge handout. It really is kind of cool because it has a lot of information in it. And this seven page handout is actually duplicated because, because there is a time suit in this scenario. If the gameplay runs and it kind of skews, let's say, to the left, and certain events happen that force you to the left, then you use this seven-page uh, handout, but you use, you know, the, the alpha version of the handout. But if it skewed to the right, 
Instead, then you use the beta version of the handout. So they provided. Oh, cool. It is kind of cool. They divide. They have this giant handout in two in two versions, so that it can be a little bit flexible. So you know, right there off the top of the board, half of the handout won't be used because you have to pick which which avenue avenue it is. But the downside is that it is seven pages long, and every time. I've run the code, which I have run this quite a bit. When it comes to digesting and having the player characters read or sometimes read aloud, especially if we're playing via Zoom or something, when it comes time for those investigators to assess and, and review that handout, the momentum of the game just, just really slows down because there's so much text. It, it takes a lot for them to kind of get through it. There's not a lot of ways to get around that. So maybe instead of putting the players uh, as a suggestion, maybe instead of having the players be responsible for reading that handout aloud, maybe the keeper should read it aloud because it does, in order to make it feel more real, it does have a few entries in it that aren't, necessarily pertinent they're they're more there for flavor so it feels like he was doing journal entries you know scientifically but maybe half of the entries are are pertinent to the scenario so as a keeper if you're reading it you couldn't you could do a a voice inflection and really kind of you know vocally stress certain entries that are truly important and then and then maybe with a softer voice or a faster tempo, read through the entries that are that are less important. So you kind of you know subtly put some emphasis on on those portions of the of the handout. So that's the only real downside. But yeah, long the, long handouts can. Uh, I think it was Mr. Corbett. That's another adventure. I absolutely love, but it's got a massive handout of like diaries over twenty years or something. Yeah, and. It's so cool to sit on your couch and read, but when you're trying to keep a game going and you hand them a novel to to do, that can be tricky. It it really can. It really can. So, you know, there's information in the handout that maybe you find an alternative way of, of conveying it to your players, which could be through encountering Kenneth himself in a in a slightly different uh, time period. Again, this this adventure, the code deals with time paradoxes and weird anomalies with time, which makes it so much fun to run. Characters seeing versions of themselves and then wondering, Ooh. "Oh my god, is that really going to happen to me?" It's just it's just super neat. The the code is one that I absolutely love. It's a brilliant scenario and it's super playable. And I'm, I've run it enough now. I feel confident that I could even run it in a convention setting. I could get this fully played in four hours and it would just be a, you know, you might be going, you might be going balls of the walls to do it, but it would be awesome. It For sure. It's a, it's a six hour playable scenario for you no know, hands down, but I think you could still do it in a four hour con slot. It is, it is that tight and that good and that much fun. I really, really enjoy the code. Well, I look forward to experiencing it one day yeah. since I've been actively avoiding it since you teased me with it so long ago. So I, uh, I was like, man, you spoil this on me. I'll bust this out right now. I'll start reading it just to spite <laughs> you. And I also do like adventures a lot that you can look at and go, we could crank this out in about five hours. Uh, I think I think a lot of emphasis gets put on the giant campaigns. Uh, you know, massive, you know, Lathotep, of course, being the king, uh, but the, you know, Beyond the Mountains of Madness and all those. And I mean, I just really love a good five hour little adventure, one, two session adventure, and then we can get on to the next one and you know, have a complete change of pace so i love a good short one because whenever i'm doing my campaigns ed they're always 
you know, almost to venture the weakish. That's that's kind of my preferred thing. I have, I, I don't know, I think I have commitment issues against the super long campaigns. So, <laughs> yeah, or it's like, well, this is going to take us a year to do. It's like, man, I could knock out. 12 short adventures in the amount of time we could do this one and you know mm -hmm. give everybody a little bit of everything but um no oh, that, that sounds cool i love the i love the idea of the of alternate handouts that's that's a cool twist it was really well designed uh when i read through it and and discovered that oh my god this is this is just a slightly different version of this handout and it's because it depends upon what avenue of approach the uh uh, the players take and do they discover this clue before this other one and if so that becomes the the dominant timeline and so then you're going to have this this version of the handout be discovered versus the other version and it's really cool now and, and keep in mind i'm trying not to spoil myself but i do have another uh question which is is one of the big ones that Whenever I'm doing my videos and, and I get comments about one thing. So like, so we got this one player who's got the code. Is this code something that, that players figure out or that characters figure out through roles? It is something that character, that characters figure out the players don't, it, it's not a puzzle. Uh, in fact, it's, it's what's interesting is that it is given whole cloth to one character and i've had runs of this where that character protected that information like it was his baby and did not reveal it to anyone and so then when the the missing piece of the time suit was discovered which it's the it's the key and it's got the punch code, you know, in my mind, it kind of looks like Predator's gauntlet, you know, with the little screen and the buttons and stuff on it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so when he when they find that piece, the other character's like, geez, well, now this, how do we use this? And this, uh, the character then steps up and goes, I think I know how to use it. But then I've had other, I've had other games where I, you know, pulled the character, I pulled the player off to the side and I said, FYI, in addition to the telegram, you also get a personal letter and it says this, da, 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 da. 10 minutes into the game, he goes, you know, because the characters, I guess, were friends with each other. He says, hey, buddies, huddle up, got something to tell you. And he just spilled his guts and it still worked there. The, um, the implied player versus player conflict, because, you know, supposedly only one of them has the code. In my runs of this, having that conflict was usually a non-issue. Uh, everyone just wanted to be cooperative with each other. It was an interesting element. It hasn't come up or it has not been a, uh, a major source of conflict in any of the runs that I've had of the code. Okay. Well, uh, for me, it is... Uh... Uh, Blackwater Creek by uh, Scott Dorward, which comes in the keeper screen pack of uh, Miss Dews and Blackwater Creek is the is the name. So it's just right there in the title. And um, have you have you played that one yet? I've read it, but I haven't played it. OK, okay so I can't spoil you. Sweet. Yeah. And I can I can I can go both barrels here. Uh, it does come with pre-generated characters. Uh, however, that, that also falls into my criticisms of it. What makes this adventure really cool is there are two completely different ways you can approach it. One of them, and this is the one that, that we did, where it, it's it's like the academic angle. And the, the investigators are sent by Miskatonic University by their archaeology department because this professor is, is missing. You know, classic Call of Cthulhu hook. And he was off on a dig site and, you know, yada, yada, yada go find out what happened to our professor. I think it's like school starts. This guy isn't there yet. But then there's this completely different other one where you're bootleggers and this mob boss calls your criminals in. And he's like, there's this really great whiskey that's coming out of Blackwater Creek. You know, we, we want you to go and, 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 and score some of this and find out like why it is like everybody's going crazy over this whiskey. So the characters are sent to Blackwater Creek, but 
do each one of those, I mean, they're like polar opposites of reasons to go. And I've heard some keepers talk about like trying to run games where they've basically got two groups simultaneously going for the same reason, which, uh, man, if you could pull that off, that sounds, that sounds amazing. Uh, to, that sounds like a nightmare for me to try to run that, but you know, evidently some people out there have done it. So the pregens that you get are only the bootlegger characters. They don't give you pregens for the, the academic side. And the criticism isn't that, it's that the other adventure in that book is also criminals and it comes with its own criminal pregens. It's like, you know, it'd be cool as if the criminal pregens worked for both adventures and then you had the academic ones that could have been optional for this one. But uh, I think Mike uh, Mason, who, who wrote the other adventure, was like, well, we kind of we wrote these adventures separately. We turned them in and we hadn't realized we were both doing criminals at the same time, which you know, I was like, that's cool. But man, it'd be really cool if you'd then gone back and said, we're going to have academics for this adventure. And then we're going to rework these criminal NPC or pregens to be able to be worked on both because that could be fun. It's also sandboxy when the fact that you get to the, this crappy little town of Blackwater Creek and there's no set agenda what you have to do. You just get a little map of the town. Um, criticism of it, though, is and I hate this. I hate it when a module gives me a very big, beautiful map of the town and it's just great looking. And then it marks get the GM information. And it's like, I can't show this to my players because there is very clearly marked on there something that they haven't discovered yet or, or something like that. And it on it, it drives me up the wall because now it's something that I get to enjoy. But then what I give my players is a crappy version that I like draw out really badly. And I've got no drawing skills at all. I'd love to have given them something that looked like mine without that. Uh, thankfully now in the days of PDFs and I have, I'm self-taught on Photoshop, meaning I'm just above terrible, but I can at least buff out the, all the all the numbers <laughs> and hand them yeah. a pretty map, but uh, I I oh I hate it when there's not I drop her the color that's near it and then color over the numbering so now it's whitewashed out or whatever you know yeah I just, just it out you know just 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 scrub that away but um yeah so you know we we've, we've got maps of the towns and and, and all of this and I would love that about it. The art in that adventure, I, I'm not a big fan of because so what's going on is through a, a giant series of, 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 of weirdness, Shub, uh, the Shub Niggeroth is being born in this cave and the, the milk of Shub Niggeroth, which appears in a lot of adventures, is corrupting the water. And, it, and all the stuff it's feeding off this water is becoming kind of mutated and bizarre. So there's like this cornfield next to it that the corn stalks are getting like 12 feet tall. And these bootleggers are basically taking the corn. They're making whiskey out of it that has been fed from the, the milk of Shibnigaroth. And it's tainted. And everything that's drinking this water is, is tainted. So anyone in the town that's drinking the water is, is kind of slowly mutating. So when you see the art of the town, all the people there look like they're like the toxic Avenger or something. Like they've got these huge boils on them. <laughs> but then you read the description and they look totally normal. But then there's like subtle things about it. Like I, like when I ran it, one of the PCs beats this little kid and the little kid's basically trying to get a nickel to buy a Coke. And the kid smiles like this big toothy grin. And I see he's got these sores on his gums. And it looks like the end of a little white worm in, in, in one of these sores is kind of like the tail is kind of wiggling. And, but the kid looked totally normal. Well, if you look at the art, yeah, they, they look like these mutant freaks. And it's like, like unclean, get away from me. So they are supposed to be mutating, just not that hardcore yet. So you can't really show them the art or it can give the keeper the wrong impression of how they're supposed to look. Uh, when, the, when the player characters arrive and you have to kind of keep track of how much water any of the PCs drink. If they like eat food that was prepared here, made out of the local water, they might start having problems. And so there's these different levels of corruption. Well, the first two are awesome. Like one of them, like boosts your stats, you know, like gets rid of, uh, of scars. And I had had a character, we did edge of darkness beforehand and she stuck her head up into the attic and the monster tore her face to shreds and she somehow lived 
Well, then we did Blackwater Creek and like the first thing is it removed all visible scars. So, man, she loved the water at first because like all of her appearance points came back. And you know, the, as, as they were going through it, they, my group ended up doing it where they didn't. I think only one of them had a minus from it, but everybody else got the two bonuses. Like it just worked out very well because I was going to at least mutate one of them. But the, you need to do this one with a bit of subtlety. And because there's two different ways you could bring a group into it, you don't know what they're going to do. Because if they're coming in with the bootleggers, they're going to, they know that there's bootleggers in town. They're going to go straight there. If they come in with the academics, they're coming for this, this archaeological dig, and they have to discover that there's even bootleggers in the town. And it, it can play just different ways. Um, if they're with the archaeological dig, and I think that's the superior way, uh, you know, you find out it's like, well, they, they stayed with this farmer and you can go to this farmer if you, if you want, and you can learn stuff there. Then you fight this crazy pig. And when I ran it, some of the, the things that we, we changed is, so there's a cult that's growing for, for, for mother. And uh, so my players, we did it. And the first session they went into the cave where this monster is growing against the wall and they dynamited it and it was exciting. And they were so beaten down that they had to then get on the road and go to Dunwich. And they basically had a, a Dunwich veterinarian because they didn't have a doctor in town, like patch them up. And then they went back to Blackwater Creek like 10, 12 days later. Well, it's like, well, what the hell's happened in this town since they left? Because, you know, this mutation is accelerating and then the the source of this evil water has uh, has kind of stopped so one of the things that happens with the corruption is like at the fourth level or so you are compelled to go to blackwater creek well it's like well this whiskey's been going out so as they were going to town they kept coming across people that were like hitchhiking trying to get to blackwater creek because they felt the calling so and like, you know, they stopped to pick one up and the guy smiles and, you know, they can see the sores inside of his mouth or like, like certain little hints that they had been seeing the first time they went and they would just speed away. They're like, yeah, hop in my car. It's like, okay. He's like, he smiles. Thanks. And I describe it and they're like, screw this. and just <laughs> floor it and leave the guy in the dust. But so when they got to the town the second time after that was done, I turned that church into full blown children of the corn level madness. Like <laughs> these, these farmers that helped them out and they shacked them up. Well, what they've done is they've taken these 12 foot stalks of corn and they have built crosses out of them and they're outside the cave and they're crucified on these crosses made out of like bound giant corn stalks. And the, the church, they have the, the cross is now covered by uh, basically two bundles of, corn that are connected at the end, it looked like vulva that they had made out of it for, for the, the, the mother's milk cult that they were doing. And like all of these people were coming from out of town and it was becoming this weird revival in this uh, just bizarre corn cult that was springing up. And these guys were public enemy number one because the townsfolk had pieced together that these out of towners had done this. So now they're sneaking around, but the population of the town has more than doubled in the 12 days that they were getting patched up because they got the crap beaten out of them the first round. So one of the things that I'd really do recommend adding is the, the idea that every day they're in town, more people start arriving. And then that can also, if they're doing the academic angle, kind of give them an idea about this whiskey because that's the, what's being exported that's getting people corrupted and bringing them to the town as they're basically watching it go insane around them. And the other thing, which in our last episode, we talked about weaving adventures together into a longer narrative is the, is, is the milk of Shemigaroth is was a key element madness in London town. So when I ran that later on and they came across the milk, they were very familiar with what it smelled like because they had done this adventure. So one of the first clues is there's like a, a little bit of, I think, milk in the corner of a guy's mouth after he is, he's killed himself with a slashing his own throat. And one of the PCs like kind of, kind of touches it and sniffs it. And it's like, Oh, you've smelled this before. And, and like the player got this really long face. Like, when did I smell this before? It's like, well, remember that, that whiskey in that town? They're like, Oh shit, guys, it's back. Yeah, like, it was just like, oh, damn it. The, 
the corn cult. And so like they immediately knew what was going on because of this just one little familiar element. And that was just so much fun because I guess the normal way you run it is you slowly figure out what's up with this weird milk. But for them, it was like the giant flashing light that like, this is 10 times more serious than we thought it was. And we already thought this was really serious, but um, now I love Blackwater Creek, but I said, I think what, what I, what I like the most about it is the fact they give you two completely different angles. Like the one you have, you're called in for an old friend, classic call of Cthulhu setup. This one's like, here's two that are as far apart as they can get. And it's still totally playable. And I don't know, I think, I think that's a really cool way of doing a, an adventure out there for somebody where the, the way we can get the hook to play that game does not have to follow even remotely the same path and it still works. So I love the addition, not the addition, but uh, making sure that the keeper remembers to start bringing newcomers into Blackwater Creek. That's a great tip because one of the angles that the keeper could even, you know, as an aside to the players and say, listen, you know, as more and more strangers are showing up in this town, the locals they might be a little on edge because of this. And so it's one of those things where you get to basically disappear in a crowd. So if you want to do any kind of uh, skulking and, and snooping about, it actually becomes a little easier because it's, it's likely that the, the locals, their attention is they're directed over there because, Hey, there's some more new guys coming in over there and they're looking to the left when you go to the right. Yeah, it's like, you know, you're not the only new faces. You're just like maybe the first of this wave of new faces or maybe mm -hmm. one or two appeared before you. And the, 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 the idea of the, the anxiety they had when they realized that more and more people were showing up and this was this growing wave and that they were at ground zero of something big that was about to happen really added a lot. What also like is when they were done, they then, of course, call the cops. And I went full shadow over Ensmith on them where like the feds came in and like basically this town was scrubbed from the maps, you know, like due to some sort of uh, reports of some sort of pestilence or disease or something. And like, you know, the, the newspapers covered it like they had like an outbreak of bubonic plague and, and whatnot. But like the feds came and they burned all the buildings down and like scrubbed it. And you never knew what, ha what they did with the locals. That was just a mystery. Uh, so I, I do like adding that little aspect to Cthulhu scenarios of like, oh, when you call the cops, uh, it's sometimes really cool. To like, okay, in the newspaper a week later, there's a story. Yeah, the story is the official report that is nothing like what you know to be the truth. Which, you know, that's Lovecraft set that up and shot over Innsmouth. And I think that mm -hmm. I've, I have used that gag in so many adventures where in the aftermath, the feds have covered up any trace and just come up with some bizarre story. The PCs know there's a conspiracy and they also know that a lot of the stories that the characters read might also be complete fabrications to cover up the, 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 the mythos threat. I love that. I love that. I need to include more aftermaths in my scenarios, newspaper aftermaths and that kind of thing. That's a great idea. Oh, you see, it'd be really cool. Is there's so many uh, things out there where you could get like the newspaper fonts and like you know a big Arkham advertiser letterhead, and just have a little uh, article in there. Yeah, that they read. And you know, uh, I've never done this in Call of Cthulhu, but I did do it in a cyberpunk game where like they would get these little scream sheets and uh, a newspaper thing. Sometimes it summarize events that happened in their own game but they were kind of twisted from the perspective of the thing. And there was like this reporter that was always reporting. They never met the reporter, but they always read this reporter's stories or whenever they were interviewing the cops, it was always the same cop it was the same one that always talked to the, the, the reporters. So like they were familiar with all these people who actually weren't NPCs in the conventional sense. There were just these repeat characters in the newspaper stories that I gave them you know, somewhere between adventures, I'd just kind of email out like, Hey guys, here you go. So 
I love that. <laughs> That's a good scenario. I like it a lot. Now, the, uh, the next topic for this one, and this is one that I have been asked about several times, either through, through my YouTube channel or just in the various uh, Call of Cthulhu groups that I'm in, whether it's on Reddit or on Facebook. And is, Call of Cthulhu is very classically seen as being set in the 1920s. That was the original time period for it. That's, I think, what the, is just the most popular setting for it overall, because it's such a, a romantic period to do that sort of investigative. But then there's an interest in doing modern day Cthulhu or, you know, what uh, a lot of times you'll have modern Cthulhu or Delta green is its own setting. That's, that's like that. And technology ends up being something that frightens a lot of game masters because a cell phone could probably rule out many of the classic adventures that we love. If the PCs just had access to a cell phone, the adventure probably wouldn't happen. So there's a lot of people that either will say, well, I want to do a modern game, but I don't want to make it too modern. So we'll set it in the 80s. So we end up with a Stranger Things sort of adventures, which that's cool. I, I have no problem with that. Uh, or, or in the 90s or, you know, some people had cell phones, but not many. And, you know, you had to pay for your minutes like out the butt. And those cell phones were only phones. They weren't mini computers. Yeah. And they're huge. <laughs> Maybe you had right. a bag um, or you had to go to your car because it was connected directly into your car. So I want to talk about running Call of Cthulhu, pure modern day, smartphones, internet, all the stuff that we have now just because I, I think that that's a, a wonderful setting and it shouldn't be as intimidating to people as it seems to be to them. Good. I agree. Yeah. I, I enjoy a modern setting and, uh, and actually Call of Cthulhu author and creator, Sandy Peterson, I've heard him say he always runs his games modern. Uh, in fact, uh, the, the, the scenarios that he's written recently for, Chaosium are modern scenarios that his whole book is uh, modern settings. So mm -hmm. yeah, and, I like it. And, and well, Sandy's talked about like horror to him is, is modern day. Cause you can picture this happening to you. Well, the call of Cthulhu setting is now 100 years ago. You know, we're, we're very distant from that, but you know, you want to, you want to know that the mythos threat is down the street right now where you live. Uh, because that is 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 more of an act of horror, and and I totally agree with that. Lovecraft, when he wrote it, was modern day to them, and he used the most modern technology. You know, Shadowver Innsmouth, yeah, you know, they have a, a submarine that's shooting torpedoes down into the reef to destroy the the deep ones. You know, submarines firing torpedoes and stuff that was brand new to them at the time. I mean, that was. You know, that was the stealth bomber of its age. You know, it was. It really brand was. Brand it now. Yep. Uh, Whisper in the Darkness. Uh, the, the cool twist on that one is it talks about there's this planet that these creatures are from. And when we discover that planet, that means it's beginning of the end. Well, that was right at the same time Pluto was discovered. Yeah, that was. It was a reference to the fact that we had just discovered Pluto. And now comes the story saying, when we find the ninth planet, they will invade. It's like very current event science that was the most edgy science or um oh man there was a fantastic movie that is vaguely similar to it uh from beyond uh has the mad scientist with the machine that uh allows you to see the creatures that exist around you and kind of this uh simultaneous parallel dimension sort of thing like so that was like mad scientist technology stuff that was all lovecraft's current world yeah you know, i think that one was like in his own town lovecraft wrote a short story called the cool air which was a horror twist on on air conditioning yeah <laughs> you know personal refrigerant to cool your home a fun story with cool air um i don't know if i i told you this when i listened to that i did it on librivox i had a woman narrator and it's all first person so my perception of it was that the hero of that story was a woman. I didn't think much of it. it Listen to the story, it was fine. And then like a couple of years later, there was like a movie version that uh, was going through Kickstarter. 
and it has a male protagonist. And I felt so offended that they gender swapped the hero <laughs> until it even occurred to me that Lovecraft would have never had a woman protagonist. It's just, I heard a woman's voice and when it's first person, it is sexless. It's just, I did this. And unless, yeah. unless another character steps in is like, Hey, Steve, you don't necessarily even know what their name is. So you just kind of accept that the, the voice, if it's audio is the gender of the hero, even though, or the, if you're reading it, the, the sex of the author is going to just by default be the, the gender of the character when really you could put on it, whatever you want. So for years, I was convinced that that was supposed to be a, a woman as the protagonist of Cool Air. <laughs> and I was so like bothered. Uh, it still <laughs> kind of bothers me to see a male in that role because that's just how I accepted it as true. Sorry, weird yeah. little side note. No, that's, that's a good story. That's, I like that. So I, th I think what we could do is, is like, like the first one that people talk about is the, the good old fashioned cell phone or the, the smartphone now. And I think the low hanging fruit, the easy trick is you don't get self-service. And I think that one is, is overdone or it can easily be overdone. Like I think a keeper would have to be very limiting on how often they actually just cut self-service to the characters. You don't want it to be like, oh, and something weird's going on. And what do you know? Your cell phone doesn't have service once again. You know, unless they are truly in the middle of nowhere or they're deep underground. That would make sense if they're in some caves that are underneath the town. Well, you don't have cell phone because you, you're underneath rock. That would make sense. Then there's the other aspects of who is on the other end of the line. So like, say they call the cops, they call 911 say, you know, there's, there's a cultist and they're, they're, they're killing people or whatnot. Well, the 911 operator could be a cultist. Uh, they'd be like, oh, sure, we'll send somebody right out. And now the PCs have basically given the bad guys exact directions to where they are, or the police could be in on this. Or there's just the classic crank calls it, it sort of thing. So I don't think that cell phones necessarily have to make it uh, rule it out. Uh, oh, especially yeah the great thing is have your build paranoia build paranoia so that your players don't trust the technology i love this uh trope in like uh movies where the protagonist is on the phone they're trying to call for help and then the person who they're speaking to who they think is a 911 operator or somebody says well dave tell me where you're at i'll send help and then the player should pause and go, I didn't tell you my name. <laughs> sure you did when you called. Uh, no, I didn't. Right? And so now they should start mistrusting this tool that they, you know, beloved and, and carry with them everywhere. Because, like you said, who's listening? But dr purposely drop that hint that the bad guys have already usurped your tool and and let the player characters already have the paranoia and distrust of their own uh, devices. The other thing I like too, because this is a real thing that people uh, freak out about and, and, you know, you know, they're constantly saying, well, my phone is listening to me, you know, because my social media is presenting ads about a product that I was having a conversation with about, you know, with my wife. And now my phone is showing me these ads. That is so blood chilling when that happens. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> and, and and there are the algorithms that they're not necessarily listening, to, but you, you've done some Google searches and stuff. They're keying in on that, right? So take it to that step and and have you know maybe the the mythos uh, entities that you're that you're doing battle with they're using just write it off hand wave it as magic right they're using some form method of tapping into your device and they are listening if not flat out tracking and then have them contact you again Anything that you can do to build paranoia and distrust of the device, you won't have to eliminate cell service. Your characters will 
destroy their phones like they're burners and throw them in the garbage so that they can't be used against them. Well, also like like creatures like the, the Migo, or which are so far beyond technologically advanced past us. Yeah, they've, they've hacked your phone. Migo have hacked your phone. Guaranteed, if they're real, they are on your phone right now. They are light years beyond us technology wise. So they're not they're not always primitive creatures. We're the primitive creatures in in some of these cases. Uh, uh, elder things, man, that flew down and created man, and you know the mountains of mass. These things are highly advanced. So you know, cracking you know our our simple version of of technology is probably just mind-numbingly easy for them to do. They did it a long time ago. Any of them that are active here, so that's. It is now you are running around with a tracking device in your pocket, or just the classic. If you if the PCs call the cops to come rescue them, great. You know the cops will be out there in about three hours. Scenario will be over in two. Yeah. Or you know the police arrive just in time to get eaten by the monster. And now right. say versus San, you're the reason that cop showed up today and got eaten by the monster. Police will arrive. Meet us at this location. We will pick you up. Oops, by the time you get there, the cops who had already gotten there have already been slaughtered. And so now you see the remnants of the cops uh, and their destroyed squad car remaining, you know. Or if it's like the small town in the middle of nowhere, it's like they've got three squad cars over this entire county. They will get there when they get there and probably way late. So I don't I don't see a problem with that. I think in the 1920s, a lot of people forget that you can call people on the phone anyway. So but now it's the first default thing that we have now. But then you, you mentioned social media, you know, social media, if, if we're using this in an investigative game, becomes just a different avenue of research, you know, where, you know, it, it, as you're looking up the missing person and stuff, you're searching Facebook and Twitter and, and, and all of that. And I think that would actually probably be some of the easiest damned handouts for a game master to make are, are, are you know, screenshots of, of Facebook posts. Oh, my God. A lot of the classic scenarios that have been published before, if you wanted to modernize them, any of these journal entries and whatnot, just rewrite them as Twitter entries, as Facebook entries, and it's the same content. Mm -hmm. You could just modernize it that way. I mean, if you were really devious, you actually make like a little hashtag and then you actually post some weird stuff on some burner Twitter account and make them pull up Twitter. <laughs> oh my and find, God. And find the clues on the real internet. Yeah. Just blend blending <laughs> LARP with it. Yes. Yeah. You know, they said the, the, the cultists, man, cultists have got cell phones too. I mean, think about it, if, if the PCs see the, the cultist and they start doing that chase you know, nothing's going to make a chase scene more dramatic as you're chasing that cultist. If you suddenly describe that they reach in their pocket, they pull out their phone and now you have to catch them as they are trying to call the, the rest of the cultists to say that you're after them. I mean, that, that adds a different level of urgency of not only do we have to catch this guy, we got to catch this guy before that call gets through. Yep. You know, you can even pull in some of the old, old, fears of devices of cameras which is you know it takes a piece of your soul well maybe a cell phone camera wielded by the by the right cultist sorcerer can you know uh who who's being aided by nyarlathotep it can take a piece of your soul so yeah get that device and you know re-download your soul back from that phone or something right <laughs> Or like, what was that thing in uh, uh, the Omen? You know, where they, every time they take a picture of somebody, <sighs> the, the, the eventual death of them was getting closer and closer Love and closer. That movie, yes. I mean, that'd be kind of interesting to do. Where, like, you know, you've got eventually where you're going on some person's Instagram, and as you're scrolling through their Instagram, you see the the threat getting closer and closer and closer till eventually it ends up being exactly the way they died. 
that could be a fun little adventure oh. of like the Instagram murders. Yeah, yeah. Uh, going through and uh, as you're looking at certain group photos of this this uh, collection of friends, everything's in sharp focus, focus except for this one character whose face is blurred out. And that's the character who dies first. And then every time you go back to that picture, another character's face is blurred out and it's it's predicting who's dying in what order and you've got to you know stop it before the next uh, blurred face person dies you know yeah and then you could ever say well is it, it's just the one on the website because i downloaded that picture it's like yeah you pull up your laptop or you download the picture and it's blurred too like well i took a screenshot of the photo the screenshots blurred too just yeah yeah, you know, one of the, the commenters that I, I had gotten had a huge question about it. And he basically was saying that he had a player who is really into IT. And that player showed the, the keeper how they could use just their cell phone to pull up blueprints on local buildings and talk about how they could ID people through all the different types of facial recognition programs that are out there. And, and then the keeper, when they were asking about it, said they basically just, they, they played a 1980s game. Like that much technology, he was worried that he wouldn't be able to adapt to keep the games challenging. Like a, a PC would just be able to whip out a cell phone and just instantly undo any adventure ever because they've got facial recognition, which I find weird. I do lots of sci-fi games where I just assume that that's like more common in the sci-fi universe than it is now. And it doesn't unravel any of our adventures there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sometimes that is part of the investigation is, well, now you got to run re facial recognition. Okay, you now have a 98% match. This is the person you're looking for. And now they have to go look for that person. But once again, bad guys got it too. You know, the, that cultist is sitting across from the Starbucks and snaps your picture and they run facial recognition. And all of a sudden the whole cult knows who you are. And they know who your friends on Facebook are and your family and your birth date and, and all of that stuff. I, well, man, that becomes a lot scarier versus your anonymous 1920s investigators roll into town on their Model T and there's no way to know who they are unless you actually get their wallet from them. Yep. Yep. You know, sometimes the bad guys can have better technology. Kind of, I know it's a, a little on the sci fi side or it is on the sci-fi side, but it gets me thinking about the movie They Live. Oh, yeah. You know, the bad guys had those watches, and it wasn't like they had ray guns or jetpacks or something. They had these watches, and they could open up little interdimensional doors, you know, and jump through them on, on the sidewalk or just, you know, teleport out of the way or something like that. But that is technology that the heroes, if they'd played their cards right, could have gotten, you know, which they did at one point, you know, but it was only slightly damaged. But it's technology, it's transferable. And and your bad guys can have better technology. They might have access to Migo technology. They might have access to technology that Nyarlathotep has uh, pulled from a distant galaxy or from the future and modified it to make it uh, simple for the apes to use in the timeline that you're playing in. So, yeah, bad guys might have better than what you've got. Oh, yeah, or they might just have access to the, 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 the NSA. <laughs> yeah. But the other thing, like with cell phones, what I love about those is they're, they, they become something really fun that the GM can wield. Like, you know, say a character's making a climb check and they fail their climb check. Yeah, you can have them fall and take a couple points of damage. Or it could be they fall and they feel the crunch in their pocket. And it's like, well, that was the penalty for failing your climb check is you broke your phone or you dropped your phone. Or one that I love is if the player characters are trying to hide because the monster or the cultist is trying to look for them and they fail that hide check, it doesn't have to be that their shoes are sticking out from underneath a curtain like they're an idiot. It could be at that exact moment, a robocaller calls their cell phone to offer them an extended warranty on their car. So they actually hid really well, except for at that moment, the phone in their pocket starts ringing and like they're scrambling, trying to turn it off. It's like all the bad guys' eyes just got to turn to that one closet and they're like, gotcha. Yeah, you know, as they pull out the phone, it's like, 
you know, that robot voice, like, we are calling you for the final time about your car's extended warranty as you're screaming for help. So those are those are different tools that a GM can use to actually explain failed roles and turn those cell phones into a liability. Yes. Make them want to break it and throw it away. <laughs> I also love the idea if if a character goes insane and they're having you know you want to give them hallucinations or there's insane insights where they get that, that brilliant idea that can sometimes help them solve the adventure is like a dead friend calling them on the phone or they just hallucinate a conversation on the phone and they've got maybe a broken phone up to their ear and they're talking to someone on the other end. When I ran uh, the derelict several years back, uh, which is on a derelict ship and one of the characters had a satellite phone when he went insane, he got a call on the phone and he thought it was the rescue choppers outside. And so they were all huddled up. They were actually pretty safe from the monster until this character believed the phone rang. Nobody else heard it ring. And he holds it up to his ear and he's like, oh, they're here. They're here. And he goes charging out and is running along the deck, waving his arms, trying to call the, the 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 helicopters down he could hear them through the phone but he just he couldn't see them in the sky above and it was just this wonderful way of doing a, a, a hallucination due to insanity and just a different means so you could use that to where also they just hallucinated their friend but that's how they got the insane insight as their dead friend is like well have you looked you know down the well and they're like, okay, they, they hang up the phone, they look down the well, and there's a thing, and then they remember their friend's been dead for three years. So that's that's a fun way you could then use the the a cell phone to either put them in harm's way or get them back on track because the players have failed to find some clue at some point or failed to come up with some idea, and you're sitting there as the keeper going, my God, how do I save this before they get bored? I'm like, ah, you're going to hallucinate a phone call. I love that idea. I love it. Uh, yes, you were talking about that. I was another uh, hallucination that you could do is, um, and it doesn't always have to be tied to their phones or something, but if you were hallucinating that you had received a message and you needed to perform a certain task, you might feel like you're assembling computer elements, computer components, but that's the hallucination. The reality is, is you're packing cans of, of pressurized spray paint inside a microwave and you're about to you're about to set it for 20 minutes you know <laughs> and you're going to stand there in front of the microwave waiting for it to uh for that computer to finish its download that you just uploaded all these uh special components into it right you know and that could that could be serving to put you in harm's way. It could also be serving because the clue that needed to be found was in that workroom or in the kitchen. And and now as your buddies come in to try and prevent you from self-harm, they discover that, oh, hey, he uncovered the clue that we needed. We were looking for that. Under all these cans of spray paint. <laughs> yep. That are now stuffed into the microwave. <laughs> The other thing that I think technology, because there's, there's always the keeper fear of it's going to make the adventure too easy for them. And the big one is also the, many times our, play, our characters are doing things that would be considered probably pretty illegal or, or, or very questionable, especially if they're doing an investigation and all these people are dying. The police might think that the characters did it. Well, now we've got the modern miracles of forensic science, and that becomes another obstacle for them to have to face is, you know, in the 1920s, I think we had just ID'd blood types, and that was it. Well, now we got DNA, man. I, I, we can, they can, they can nail you. You've got, we've actually got security cameras. We've actually got, they can pull up your GPS on your phone to see where you were. So the player characters now have the added threat when they're dealing with the mythos, they have to actually scrub whatever evidence of their being there because the police, when they're investigating the fallout of this, even though the player characters, the ones that saved the day might find evidence of the player characters being there. And that can start leading to different questions. And in a modern day setting, 
I think a game master could have it to where you have like two or three adventures and just in the back of your head, you're thinking, okay, this evidence was left. This evidence was left right now. There is a file folder somewhere in the FBI that is just growing. And then finally you, you have them get caught. Now this might lead to another adventure or it might lead to some bizarre chase as the feds have been building this case against the PCs for just some of the most horrific crimes that the PCs are actually the ones that save the day from, but they're getting the blame for. So that's the, that's the other aspect technology does is man, that anonymity where you can go and save the day and blend off in the night and no one knew you were there. That's getting a little harder to do. Agreed. Agreed. Another uh, detractor for having uh, this technology that's readily available is characters, uh, especially if they're trying to lean in and use this technology, the uh, the characters and the players, they stop relying on actual experts. So if your cell phone can translate different languages, you typically aren't leaving the crime scene or the area of uh, that's in question to go and seek out an expert. So as you're staying there trying to do this, you know, slow by hand, you know, Google translate, uh, the, the mythos creature has returned and you're still here to be eaten. You know, when, if you had just left <laughs> to go to the university and, and talk to the professor, you may not have been here uh, for the uh, for the monster to find, you know. So these convenient tools can be a hindrance if you if you think that uh, well, I've got this tool at my disposal, I can use it. That may not always be the best answer. Or if they're if they're doing Google Translate, because you know what they should do is if nobody speaks French or Greek or whatever. Instead of going and finding the expert to translate or going to the library and do it, if they're just going to try to use Google Translate, it's like, oh, we're going to do that, but that's going to have a penalty die. And if you don't know why it would have a penalty die, you have never used Google Translate before yep. because it is going to give you some nonsense half the time. So that that is not better than finding you know a high school student that's like their second year French because it's going to give you some strange responses to, to yeah. what you think you're trying to do. And, you know, once again, um, now you've got this stuff in your, your, your Google search history. And, uh, you know, if you're, if your cultists or bad guys have that, that technological advancement or the God forbid, they have put something on your technology to track you, to, to read your cookies uh, and whatnot. You know, you've really just put a massive target, not just on yourself, but well, because of social media, your your family and your friends, they know where you live. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, man. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that would be a great thing, too, is if uh, you could use it. <laughs> you're, you're trying to be on the down. Maybe, you know, you've you've communicated in person with a loved one. Hey, I'm going to be okay. I'm going to go do this thing with my buddies, but stay here where you're safe. And then you maybe check your Facebook account and you can see that your loved one is, is posting online about what you are doing. And, you know, Hey, prayers for my buddy, you know, prayers for my <laughs> son. They're going out and trying to do this dangerous thing. Need uh, need all my prayer warriors to come out and help. And like, you're sending the cops to me. <laughs> Stop, stop telling them where I'm at. Damn it, mom. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. That's, I thought about that. That's wonderful. Uh, <laughs> please don't, please don't post what we're doing online. And you've got that one idiot friend or that's, right. that's what they do during their bout of madness is they start live tweeting, you know, what's going on. <laughs> 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 so for 10 rounds, they're just sitting there on Twitter. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, you're trying to hide and somebody does a selfie. Flash. <laughs> Tags you. Yeah, my God. That, but yeah, I don't think there's a problem with the technology. Like I said, you've, I've played a lot of just different games that were, I guess, always modern. But for some keepers, I think they look at Call of Cthulhu and they see it as being inherently 1920s. And that somehow going modern takes away from that 
versus it's just a different flavor of horror. Because if you, if I'm running a cyberpunk game where at the tips of their fingers is more technology than we have now, and I can still do a mystery, I can do a mystery in 2021, no problem. I can do it in the future. I can do it in the past, but they, they're all going to be different based off of just the constraints of, of the time. But every piece of technology is a double-edged sword. And especially when you consider the bad guys got it too. I, I will, a little insider baseball, I'm trying to write a scenario that is basically a haunted house, except this house is uh, a smart home. It's, it's loaded to the gills with the latest technology. So you can talk to the house and it will do things, except now it has a, it has an attitude. Oh yeah. Yeah. See, that's something you couldn't do in the 1920s, but we can definitely do now. Uh, yep. it, it just different flavor of horror. And, and I, I love that aspect to it. So anyways, for any keepers out there, if you are afraid to try modern day, I actually really suggest it. There's a lot of, cool twists you can do and you can make it to where the characters and even the players are more afraid of having their technology on them where it starts becoming oh we're going to go solve the crime we're all going to put our cell we leave our cell phones at home we don't want our gps to to ever be used against us we want to we're going to we're going to turn this stuff off because we don't want to incriminate ourselves and all that so if you if you do it right they will actually try not to bring the technology with them. Oh yeah. The, they'll invest in a, in a gun safe and put all the phones in the safe lead lined <laughs> so that it can't get a signal in or out. It's awesome. Well, I think that does about for this episode. I think actually I'm really happy with this one, but we can't do this show alone. So we do want to thank our amazing editors, uh, Max Mahaffa and Edward Nagy for their hard work and keen skills at making us sound awesome and can cut out all the parts where we go silent and are trying to figure out how words work. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Uh, and we also want to thank John Sumro. He is an amazing, badass artist. He's incredibly talented. So please, Follow him on Facebook, check out his official website, and consider joining his patron account. We will have links for all of these places where you can follow John Sumro in our show notes. And finally, we want to thank the Darkest of the Hillside Thicket for generously allowing us to use their song, Gluttony, as our intro and outro music. If you're a fan of Lovecraft's writing and of the Call of Cthulhu role-playing game, you need to check out the Darkest of the Hillside Thicket. Uh, you can check out their Bandcamp site or their official band site. We're going to stick the links down in the show notes. Please check them out. And once again, thank you so much for letting us use that song. Thank you all for listening. We'll see you next episode. Oh, man, I'm glad that's over.